Welcome. Um, so today we are going to talk about uh, the growth function. This is a concept that, we will that will allow us to understand the fat type of M in the, in, the, uh, in the generalization bound. So ultimately what we want to do is to do the following sequence of analysis. Last lecture we talked about the generalization band, but we realized that there's a problem of having M, uh, the, the M hypotheses. And at the end of the last lecture, we tried to introduce this general strategy of trying to understand the overlapping regions of the data sets. And instead of just looking at the entire space, we argue that can we just look at the training samples? And from the training samples, maybe we will be able to, uh, to, 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 to reduce the number of M. So in this lecture, we are going to continue that story. We will go into more detailed analysis of how do we analyze this factor of M. So there are two parts of this lecture. The first part, we will talk about how do we make the decision based on the training samples. And I'm going to introduce a concept called the dichotomy. And then in the second half of this lecture, we will talk about a notion called the MH. This is the number of, uh, effective number of, of, of hypotheses that you will ever have in the data set. I call it the MH. That's also called it the growth function. So we want to introduce these two in this lecture. And then in the next lecture, we will talk about a very, very powerful thing. It's called the VC dimension. And then the VC dimension will give us the effective the, the degrees of freedom that we have in modeling the data sets. That is also what we, we would define the model complexity. How complex is the model measured in terms of VC dimension? Uh, I also want to mention that the thing that we're discussing uh, in, in the last lecture, this lecture, and also in the VC dimension, they are very, very general. They can be applied to any kinds of machine learning algorithms, including as simple as a linear model to as complicated as a deep neural network. Okay, so to start with, let's talk about the strategy again. What do we have? Well, we are in this framework called the PACK framework. Let me just remind you, we have this probability of having a bad event, and we want to make sure that the confidence is bounded at least uh, 1 minus delta. Uh, the approximately correct says that I want my approximation to be as small as possible. And so uh, if you can find a learning algorithm that can make this happen, by happen, I mean that you can, you can find an N that is big enough uh, such that for any uh, epsilon and delta that the above inequality we hold, then you say that the target function is pack learnable. So we also look at this factor of N. This factor of N comes from the fact that we are looking at not just one hypothesis, but the final hypothesis G. And therefore, you will have a factor of M that goes into your training procedure. If you're only looking at one hypothesis H, then you're just looking at testing. But since we're looking at training, then we need to look at the entire training data set. We need to look at entire hypothesis sets. Therefore, you will have a set of M hypotheses to choose from. And therefore, you need to have a factor of M that goes into your, your halving inequality. So what? Well, M is a constant, as I mentioned before. But M can be very, very large, even for linear cases. Okay? And so the good news is that we will be able to bound this M, and, and then we will do it in this lecture. So what is the strategy to bound this M factor? Uh, we realized that the, the, there's a bad event. This bad event is measuring the M hypothesis being outside this epsilon bound. Uh, and we realized that the source of the problem comes from the union bound, the union bound says that I have a set of events, and then they are, they are not overlapping. And therefore, uh, when you try to sum them up, it, this upper bound, this upper bound over here, will be a pretty good upper bound. But if they're overlapping, then the union bound is a very, very bad uh, upper bound. So what can we do is really to look at the overlapping area, OK? So let's try to recall the strategy we introduced last time. And this time, let's be more careful. So let's imagine that you have a set of red dots, and then you have a set of blue dots. Okay? And then now you have, this, uh, uh, you have the black line, as I'm showing you here. And then you have the, or the gray line that I'm showing you there. If you make a small change from the black to the gray, what will happen, 
to the area, the green area and the pink area, there will be some change and that is quantified by delta E out. Correspondingly, there will be a change in terms of the E in. The E in will, call, will, will be measured by the number of blue dots that will become misclassified and the number of red dots that will become misclassified. Why would this happen? Because if you move from the, uh, the, 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 the black line to the gray line, originally, uh, this is a blue dot here that is, uh, wrongly classified. But now if you move the gray line to the, the, the black line to the gray line, then the blue dot will become correctly classified, right? So there will be a change in also the training sample. So if you make a small change in your in, in, in your E out, correspondingly, there will also be a small change in your E in as well. Okay, so that, this is what we should expect to see. If you, if you, you have two hypotheses, E in and E out, uh, and, and then you have H1 and H2, when you try to evaluate the, uh, the, the generalization bound on e, uh, H1, it should be very similar to when you try to evaluate the generalization bar for E out, uh, for, for H2. So the strategy that we introduced last time is to look at the training samples only instead of looking at the entire space. Okay, so here's our goal. Our goal is to find something to replace the M because we know that the M is a very, very big number. Um, but M is big because the whole space is big. When by whole space, I mean that the whole space of all the possible hypotheses, this is extremely big. Even in a 2D case, you have infinitely many hypotheses to choose from. Uh, so let's, but we can also look at the input space instead of looking the, 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 the entire space. Okay. So, so this is the input space. The input space, you have all these possible uh, uh, hypotheses. So you can have one hypothesis, you can have the other hypothesis. Even if you look, just look at the, the line slightly tilted by a certain small angle, you have a different hypothesis. Okay? So this is a very, very big set of hypotheses. Now, if you change the game to not looking at the entire space, okay, but um, but let's look at the training samples, then you have a different scenario. Okay. So this diagram is still showing you that uh, you, have, you have infinitely many, many M's. But let's change the game to the following. Uh, so if, if we restrict ourselves to only a set of training samples, then this is going to happen. So here in this diagram is the same set of four examples that I'm showing you in the previous uh, slide. But in this example, I'm drawing you all the training samples. These training samples, they are located all in the same place in these four examples. Okay. So now uh, let's look at these four cases. The first one is that you have a purple area that is on this side and then you have a green area on this side. Uh, and then you have one separate hyperplane. Now, you can imagine that what if you move the, the, your, your, your red line just by tilting it by a small angle, very, very small angle. Will it change the decision boundary? Will it change, will it change, the, will it change the training samples that, is, that are being correctly classified versus wrongly classified? It will not change. Okay. If you, if you move your, your, this red line, if you move this red line, uh, slightly, uh, uh higher or lower, it, it won't, it won't, it won't significantly change the, the outcome of the training sets. Okay. Now, when will it change? Well, it will change unless your, your red line suddenly becomes there. Okay. You, you change your entire hypothesis, uh, from, from this case to that case. Okay, then of course you will change the behavior of your training samples. It's, it's still the three training samples, however the labels will become different. So at this case, and this case. Okay, but then in this situation you see that the number of, effective number of hypotheses is significantly lower 
than all the possible hypotheses in this 2D space. The, the number of all the possible hypotheses will just be infinite because you have infinitely many uh, 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 choices of your separate hyperplane. However, for, uh, uh, for this three data points, the number of hypotheses that would that will completely change the labeling, uh, that will be a finite number of examples. Okay, so the idea here is to just look at the training sample. And what we can do is that we can put a mask on the training data sets. And let's do not care about the, uh, uh, un until a training sample flips its sign. Okay, so what I mean is that you look at the training training data points, and then you you put you put either either purple or green as what we have done before, okay, and then you don't you don't worry until you see there's a flipping of the sign. So here we are we're going to define a new concept called the dichotomies. So it is a new name here, and dichotomies names uh, it really means the number of mini hypotheses. So there's a difference between hypothesis and a dichotomy. Hypothesis says that if you give me a, a data a training sample uh, that is a sample in the space of X, I'm going to return you a sequence of labels, either plus one or minus one. And this, I have infinitely many hypotheses because I just have infinitely many data points. For every data point, I need to give you a, a, a classification result, okay? Now, the, the, the number of the dichotomies is different. It says that you're going to give me a set of training samples. For these training samples, I'm going to give you a string Okay, and each string, each, each string will be associated with, with each possible configuration in your, in your training set. So you can have a different hypotheses, but then you will have the same dichotomy. Now let me explain the difference using a diagram. In this diagram, you have how many hypotheses? Well, you have infinitely many hypotheses because the space is a 2D space. And no matter what the, the training samples they're located, you just have a, you have a 2D space and therefore you have infinitely many choices of the black lines, okay? Uh, and some of the black lines are good bad lines and some of the black lines they're bad, but you have infinitely many of those. And by, by moving this black uh, uh, around, you have a different hypothesis. Now the diagram I'm showing you on the right, that is the situation for a dichotomy. You look at this diagram, you see that here you have one black line, and as long as uh, my black line is moved but it does not cross a blue dot, my decision of the training samples will remain the same. Okay, so this is called a dichotomy. A dichotomy means that I'm looking for a case where the, the training samples, they're not flipping their signs. So the gap between the dichotomy and the hypothesis, as it's called, that dichotomy is really a set of mini hypotheses. They are a subset of hypotheses. And this subset of hypotheses, they are enough for us to quantify the effective number of M. So let me elaborate further using the example below. So technically, how do we define the dichotomy? Uh, let's define a set of data points uh, x1 through xn, as I'm showing you here. Uh, so you have all these uh, uh, data points x1 through xn. And then the dichotomy is generated by a hypothesis set okay, on these data points. Okay, now I need to be very careful in describing the, the terminology. The dichotomy formally is defined as a number. Okay? It, would be defined, it would be defined as a set. The set is a set that contains all the possible hypotheses, okay? And then the hypotheses, they will be different, 
Okay, so you look at look at this equation here. On the left hand side, that's defining the dichotomy. It is a it is a, uh, a function generated by your hypothesis set. So you, first of all, you need to give me the hypothesis set. Let's say you're still working on the linear model. Then all the hypotheses that you're considering would be the would be the lines. And then this set of hypotheses will be applied to the data points x1 through xn. Okay, and therefore your edge is taking all the, and this notation says your edge is taking all the, all the training samples. That is going to return you a set. Okay, now what are the sets? The sets would be the set that contains a lot of strings, and each string will take the form of h applied on x1 through h applied to xn. Okay, and then all the h will be drawn from your, your hypothesis set. Okay, so this could be a little bit complicated. Let's look at the diagram. Uh, so in this diagram, let me just draw you uh, three data points, A, B, and C. Okay, so this A, B, and C, uh, they are the three data points all located in the 2D space. Um, now, suppose I draw you a yellow line, like what I'm showing here. Okay, so, I, so you have a, a yellow line. This is your yellow line. Now, once I draw this yellow line, the yellow line is one edge in my hypothesis set. Once I draw this yellow line, I can say that anything that is on the right hand side of the yellow line will be uh, called plus one. Anything on the left hand side will be called minus one. Then I will generate a string of minus one, minus one, and minus one. Okay, this is the, the string I have for this particular uh, 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 hypothesis. So, uh, that would be one number that is happening in my dichotomy set. Okay, so the dichotomies would be a set of all these strings, minus one, minus one, minus one, or minus one, plus one, minus one, etc. that comes from the set of hypotheses and then on these three data points. So let's try to understand a little bit more by looking at the second case here. So the second case says that it's the same data set, um, but then I have, uh, I have my, my, my yellow line that is drawn in this way. So in this case, you can see that I have a, I have a, I have a point that is marked uh, as A. Now it, be, it, will become, it will be marked as plus one. The rest will be marked as minus one. So by using this or, or a yellow line, you have a, you have created a string of plus one, minus one, and minus one. Okay, this is the second string that you can ever generate from this three-point data set using a linear model. Okay, so the second string would become another element that shows up in your dichotomy set. Okay, so this is a dichotomy. It is a set contains all the strings, and then the second one will become one element inside your dichotomy set. You can keep going this exercise for the remaining uh, six cases. So you can have plus, plus one, minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, et cetera, et cetera. So you can have all these cases. These are all the dichotomies that you can generate using these, uh, using these uh, 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 linear models applied to these three data points. According to this definition, you should also be clear that the dichotomy is data set dependent. If you change the ABC in this example to three different locations, then you will have a set of three different, then, then you will have a different set of dichotomies. So dichotomies will change as you change the ABCs. Now, uh, if you just rotate the ABCs or you move the ABCs around, it is possible that the dichotomies will remain the same. However, if you try to make on the ABCs, they are, they are all sitting along the same line, then you can see that the dichotomies, some of the dichotomies, uh, these elements may not be allowed. Okay? They may not be able to show up. So we, let, we will talk about that point later. The, the message here is that the dichotomies, it is a, it is a, a, a mini hypothesis, it's a set of mini hypotheses, and these hypotheses, uh, it can be arbitrarily drawn as long as they do not change 
the, the labeling of the data points, and the dichotomies, they are the function of the training data points. Okay, so let me talk about the cases where the dichotomies are not allowed. So imagine that now you put the ABCs, they are putting on the same line, then we, we are, we're keeping the same uh, 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 the three dots, okay? And then we want to ask, is it possible to, to, to draw a line uh, that, can, that can cover all the possible uh, strings? Now, we know, we know that there are the three numbers here, and so the total number of strings will be eight, two to the power of three, that will be eight. And so now if you draw the diagram in this way, uh, you can see that there are two cases that you will not be able to, f to draw one yellow line that can classify the data points as what I want. Okay, so for example, in this case, I have a blue, red, blue. There is no way for me to draw a yellow line that can make uh, the two blue dots and then uh, have one red dot in the middle. And I'm just not able to create that. So it's the last case. Okay, now if you look at the string number, you look at, you, you see that, uh, the, the, the blue, 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 this one is minus one, minus one, minus one. And in the next case is minus one, minus one, uh, plus one, minus one, minus one. These are all possible strings that can be generated according to this dichotomy. Now, when you look at this case here, um, you have minus one, plus one, and minus one. This dichotomy is not allowed to be generated because I am using a, a linear function as my, my hypothesis says. And because I'm linear and because the, the, all these blue and red dots, they are living on the same line, I am not able to, to classify them. So now at this point, we can see that there, there seems to be a way for us to replace the M using the dichotomy as follows. So here is our candidate to replace the, 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 the M. We will, we are going to define a term called the growth function. And this growth function is, is defined as the maximum. You look at the right hand side of this equation. It's the maximum of this, the number of, in this, the number of dichotomies. So the absolute value stands for the number. Okay. So H is a set. Net H is a, is a set defines the, the, the dichotomy on the data sets, on the data points x1 to xn that I'm have, currently having. And so when you put the absolute value, you're measuring the number of dichotomies that can ever be generated. Okay? So if you look at the previous two examples, in the first case, there are eight cases. Okay, because I have three data points. If these three data points, they are not located at the same line, then the number of dichotomies will be eight. If you look at the second example I'm showing you here, when you put the, on the three points on the same line, then the number of dichotomies that you can ever generate will only be six, because the two cases, they are not allowed. So let's also look at this maximum here. The maximum here says that I am going to look at this number and then I am going to, to reconfigure the location of my data points in such a way that the number of dichotomies can be maximized. Okay. So now let's say I give you three data points. You can, you can, you can move the data points around in whatever way you want. You can choose to put them into a line, which is a very, very bad choice. And in that case, you will have six dichotomies. And then that is not maximizing, maximizing my, the number here. But if you go to a good case where you just put the three, uh, three points that are, that are around the triangle, then the number of dichotomies can be maximized. Indeed, it is the maximum ever you can achieve with the three data points using a linear model. Okay, uh, and therefore the, the, this maximum, uh, the, the maximum would define the, the, this has a unique number that is independent of the training set that you have. So no matter what training set you give me, I'm going to find you the maximum possible number of dichotomies that can ever be generated using the hypothesis set. And I define this number to be my growth function. It is a function M depending on h, h is my hypothesis set, 
And that's also a function of n, where n is the number of training samples that I have. And I do not care about the specific training samples because I have already e uh, e uh, evaluated the, the training samples uh, using this max operation. So you give me a hypothesis set H, and then you tell me that there are n training samples. And then my job is to do whatever I can by allocating x1 to xn carefully so that the number of dichotomies will be maximized. Uh, and maximum number of dichotomy is the best I can ever do with the hypothesis set that you give me. Uh, so mh of n is, is really describing how expressive is your hypothesis set. Now, I want to clarify one thing. This M, M, MH is really not the, not the way to say its expressiveness, okay? So this is just really a proxy to describe the expressiveness of the hypothesis set H, okay? It is sort of giving us a hand-waving notion of if I have this hypothesis set H, uh, how, how complicated can this set be? So you can imagine that you have, you have a 2D space and then you draw a linear line, then the number of cases that you can draw uh, would be limited by the model that you're choosing. So if you have a large H, MH, then it will become more expressive. Uh, that means you have a more complicated H. And so that should be a, that seems to be a good candidate for your, your M factor. Okay. Now, the good thing is that mh is only depending on, on the hypothesis set and also your n, and it doesn't depend on your learning algorithm A, so that, that will, will make us uh, independent of the learning algorithm or the learning model that we're choosing. Uh, it only depends on the hypothesis set. As long as you tell me that I want to go with a linear model, as long as you tell me this is the number of data points that you, I have, then that will be the, uh, the, uh, 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 mh would be the number of, uh, of possible hypotheses you have uh, in terms of this dichotomy. Okay, now one more thing is that this mh also doesn't depend on the, uh, on the distribution px. So I, uh, so, so why? Well, that's because I, I don't really care about the individual, uh, data samples. I only care about the max. Because I'm taking the max, I have illuminated over all the possible, uh, uh, data samples that I have in my data sets.